Take a second to imagine your favorite piece of art. You've probably looked at it many times, right? And chances are you would notice a little more detail each time you admired it. This is how I understand the world under a microscope in the science lab. The more you look, the more you see. Indeed, the idea of complexity in science is much more the rule than the exception. Drugs may be life-saving or altering, but they all have side effects. There are pros and cons to most all of our understandings in science and medicine. So today, I motion for you to apply this dualism to the understanding of one of biology's most feared entities, viruses. I first became interested in virology, the study of viruses, in college. Yes, call me crazy for being interested in viruses of all things. But the thing is, I was fascinated when I first learned about the exquisite mechanisms of viruses. Despite being one of the smallest biological entities on the planet, and considered by many scientists to be non-living. A couple years ago, I took this picture, which I found to be so cool that I had it printed onto a poster and hung it up in my room. Even though this image isn't quite as museum worthy as Monet's magpie, to me, this scientific image is art. There is an entire story to be told within it. For starters, it's an action shot. The image was taken using a super powerful microscope that not only detects fluorescence from different dyes, but allows you to image cells in their microenvironment in real time. To orient you, the green dye represents a type of cell found on the outer surface of the human eye. And many of the little red dots surrounding the cell are viruses. Each little virus particle is diffusing about until some eventually bump into and enter the cell on specific cell surface receptors. Once inside the cells, the viruses hijack the cell's machinery to copy their genes and create new progeny virus particles, all within a matter of minutes to hours for some viruses. The cell, on the other hand, does not want to be infected by a virus. If it gets infected, many of its normal processes could be thrown out of sync, causing any number of problems that we could eventually realize in the form of pain or discomfort. For the past year, the news around viruses has, of course, been overwhelmingly frightening and somber. Millions of lives have been lost to COVID-19. This contextualizes my talk on viruses in a time when they are incredibly destructive and have caused so much pain for so many people. But the reason why I'm giving this talk is to look ahead to our future interactions with viruses and hopefully provide hope that some of those encounters will actually be positive. In fact, I hope to convince you about some of the ways in which viruses could be an incredible tool to promote health and wellness in humans. Viruses have already been used as a treatment for many diseases, and there's a great deal of ongoing research investigating additional therapies. These therapeutic approaches mainly rely on exploitation of the unique properties of viruses. So before we get any further, let's detour into a brief overview of Virology 101. In this same image, I magnified out a clump of viruses. These viruses, or any viruses for that matter, can be understood in terms of two main components, a genome made of nucleic acid and a surrounding proteinaceous shell. Here, I depicted the protective outer shell, which I like to think of as a UPS truck. That's because, just like a UPS truck drives through the neighborhoods and protects the packages inside before delivering them to houses, the outer shell of a virus protects delicate nucleic acids as the virus diffuses through extracellular environments before ultimately delivering its genome into a cell. Moving right along to Virology 102, you can see I added the nucleic acid into the viral shell and similarly added a package into the UPS truck. The job of viruses is to deliver their genetic material into cells, which will then be used to make more copies of the virus. And while the UPS truck doesn't quite enter your house, hopefully, it does drive up to it and drop off your package to be brought inside and processed by you. You can see the power in this. 
A virus could be engineered to potentially deliver whatever a human cell needs. One particularly relevant example of that is the use of viruses to protect us from other viruses, as is the case with some COVID-19 vaccines. Take, for example, the recently FDA-approved Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine, which is viral vector-based. Johnson & Johnson exploited the unique life cycle of viruses, such that a type of virus called adenovirus was used as a preventative agent from future viral infection. To do this, J&J &J turned your UPS package into a code for the prominent spike protein found on the outer surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Because the genetic code for the spike protein is introduced in your cells by a harmless virus that cannot cause infection, your cells can read the code and translate it into many versions of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Your cells then display little pieces of the spike protein on their surface, which prompts circulating immune cells to respond to and remember its specific characteristics. That way, if you were exposed to SARS-CoV-2 in the future, your body already has a stockpile of specific antibodies against it, which would either prevent infection entirely or dramatically improve the course. In addition to the mechanism for vaccines, viruses can be used to deliver a normal gene copy into a cell in which that gene is abnormal or absent. This is a type of gene therapy, and the UPS package in this case is the healthy gene that ideally restores normal function to the cell. One of the most enticing conceptual examples of viral gene therapy is for the gene called TP53, which is dubbed the guardian of the genome. The P53 protein made by this gene gets that name because its job is to act as a tumor suppressor. So when cells acquire mutations or DNA damage and are unable to repair those issues, P53 prevents the cell cycle from progressing further to avoid the potentially cancer-causing division of cells with mutations. When you consider that P53 is the most common target for genetic alterations in cancer, with its mutant copies found in 50 to 70% of human tumors, you can imagine how incredible it would be to engineer a virus that can restore function to this critical protein. And finally, Sticking with the topic of cancer-fighting viruses, I want to touch on oncolytic virotherapy. In this application, viruses are utilized to kill cancer cells, either directly by stimulating an immune response or both. The trick here is that cancer cells are adept at evading detection by our, by our immune system. That's why unleashing a UPS package of viruses engineered to recognize cancer cells and induce controlled and targeted tumor destruction could greatly improve the course of a patient's cancer. In the top example of direct cell killing, the virus infects cancer cells and sufficiently disrupts their function such that they die. In the bottom panel, a tumor which may have been previously undetectable to the immune system suddenly becomes a visible target again after viral infection. Circulating immune cells then recognize the cancer cells as infected and mount a fatal response against them. And keep in mind that some degree of both of these scenarios could be happening at the same time. So in summary, viruses can be a huge part of how we move forward in science, medicine, and everyday life, not only through the current pandemic, but in the future as we continue to interface with innumerable diseases on a daily basis. Viruses are phenomenally adaptive biological entities, so mastering and manipulating their exquisite mechanisms may help to ameliorate or eliminate many diseases. So in light of today's theme of motion, I urge you to consider the ways that one of nature's most feared predators could move us forward. Thank you.